Hello everyone, I'm Kyle Gerald, and I have the privilege of being the pastor of Countryside Free Methodist Church in Sandusky, Michigan. The message you are about to hear was previously recorded. If you'd like to catch one of our services in action, we'd love to have you stop by for our 10 a.m. service, or check it out on our Facebook page at Countryside Free Methodist Church. God bless, and thank you for listening. If you would, please open your Bibles with me this morning to Colossians chapter 3. And I am hoping and praying that you will be joining me in stepping out in faith in some new ways this new year. And I hope and pray that you are, along with me, eager to please and to serve the one who made us, our creator, our savior, and our Lord. And if you haven't already done so, I want to encourage you to to go back and watch or listen to the message from the very first day of this new year. Uh, either on our, on our website or Facebook page uh, or YouTube, um, because it's going to provide a, a great deal of context for where I believe God is leading us in the days ahead in this new year. And I, I can't cover all of the details with you of that first service here this morning, but let me just pause and say that there were basically four areas, and those of us that were here, I challenged everybody to go to one of the four corners of this room to represent where they felt God was speaking to them the most in that moment. And so we're going to be covering those four areas in a, uh, a number of ways over this next, uh, this next year. And one of those ways is that we're going to be gathering together to meet for some special times of prayer and strategizing in those four areas. And I'm going to put that slide up here to give you a heads up on when those times are coming. The first one is tonight. And we're going to be, we're going to be praying over our church. We're going to be strategizing some prayer approaches you know, for this upcoming year here. We're going to meet back here in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. tonight. So if you would be interested in joining us for that, I would welcome you to do so. Come back and join us for that time. Next week is going to be CARE. All about speaking, reaching out to those that are on the fringes, that are, are somehow getting left or neglected or, or left behind. So I want to encourage you to, to come back for that. The next week, February 3rd, is discipleship. And then the following week is growth. And we're going to talk about those a little bit more in the days and weeks ahead. So last week, uh, I, we started with and we highlighted prayer because we want to start with prayer. Whether we're talking about our service here on a Sunday morning or starting your day, it's always a good idea to start with prayer. Amen? Always a good idea because we want to seek God's heart and his perspective on how we should be doing this thing we call life. And not just trying to chart our own course, but hearing from our Father first and foremost. And so uh, if you'd like to engage with us in that process of, of, and again, see what it's like more, I want to invite you to come back here tonight and join us for that time of prayer and, and strategizing. Next week, like I said, we're going to be looking at, at the care for those that have a heart for caring for God's flock. You know, when Jesus was resurrected, he came back and he appeared to his disciples a number of times. But one of those times that he appeared to them, they'd been out fishing for the night. And Jesus wasn't with them fishing, but... But as morning broke, Jesus was standing on the shore of the lake, and he called to them, and they came in as quickly as they could, and he had breakfast with them. And it was at that time that Jesus pulled Peter aside, because Peter, you remember, had denied that he even knew Jesus three times. And so Jesus spent some time reinstating him as an apostle. And Jesus asked him three times if Peter indeed loved him. And each time, Peter, of course, said yes. And, and to each of Peter's replies, Jesus had a similar response. First, he said, Peter, feed my lambs. And he said, take care of my sheep. And he said, feed my sheep. And by lambs and sheep here, it's pretty safe to say that Jesus was referring to his followers. So Jesus wanted to make sure that when he was gone, when he was ascended into heaven, that his followers, his sheep, his flock was cared for and fed. And he was giving that primary task to Peter, saying, Peter, to the very best of your ability, make sure no one is left behind. But you know what? Just like sheep, there are lots of reasons, aren't there, that people get left behind or neglected. They get sick. They're gone for long periods of time. They get distracted by other things. Guys, we're a lot like sheep in that way. We get distracted by a lot of things. 
And we don't want to see anyone neglected or left behind around here. And that's what our, our care team is going to be focusing on in this next year. So I want to, again, encourage you to join us next week if you've got a heart for caring for God's people. All right, let's dig into Colossians chapter 3. Okay, the, the, uh, the church in the town of Colossae was just being hammered back in the first century by someone or some group of someones who were insisting that Jesus alone wasn't enough for their salvation or, or enough for a person to live a full life. So the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to their church, which has now become our book of Colossians. And in it, he confronted these false teachers and their false teacher by holding up Jesus as Lord over all. And Paul makes it clear to his readers that Jesus and God are one, one and the same, and that Jesus not only participated in the creation of everything, but also became human and suffered while he was here on earth on our behalf. And his, his death and his resurrection were the price that he paid for our salvation. Folks, Jesus reigns supreme, and that was the point of Paul's letter here to Colossians. And because of his sacrifice, we can experience new life in him. God wants us to experience this new life in Christ by setting our minds on God's priorities, putting to death the old life, and putting on the new life. So let's unpack each of these over the next several moments here, beginning with number one and verses one and two of Colossians chapter three. Paul writes, Since then you have been raised with Christ, Set your minds on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. So let's talk about that, setting our minds on things above. Have you ever thought about what heaven is going to be like? How many of you have wondered, you pictured it, you, you think about it from time to time? Okay, you know what? As a follower of Christ, it's totally natural that we spend some time thinking about what heaven's going to be like, right? Right? I mean, we're going to live there someday. So why not? Think about it. And it's okay if you get occasionally lost in thought thinking about the, the streets of gold, you know, or about, or about whether we're going to walk or fly from place to place when we get up there to heaven, right? Or whether your favorite pets from here on earth are going to be with you there in heaven. And you know what? It can be, it can be very comforting to think of our heavenly dwelling with our heavenly Father when all pain and grieving is over and done. But folks, I, that occasional wonderment is not what Paul, I don't think, is talking about here. Paul's not saying that we should become, you know, so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly use. Maybe you've heard that phrase before. So wrapped up with the tiny little details of heaven that we're neglecting things down here. But rather, he's saying that we are doing our best to see things from God's perspective, what's important to him, not just in our hearts and lives, but also in the rest of our world. See, God wants us to experience new life in Christ by setting our minds on God's priorities. All right, take a look at this photo up here on the screen, okay? All right, we, I'm going to try to point out a few things here for you. We have big yellow balloon right in the middle, okay? We have a vintage Pepsi can right over there, um, this is a cell phone, it just, and right now it happens to be on Fruit Ninja. Um, this is a little pyramid puzzle. I don't know if any of you have ever seen those. Simple stick grabbed out of the backyard, folks. That's all that is. Um, that's a rock <laughs> picked up off the ground. And then you got a little teddy bear there, okay? So pretty simple objects there. So if I were to ask you the question, what's the most important thing in this photo? I'm guessing I get a number of different answers. Different, depends on who you ask, right? How about this one? What's the most valuable thing in this photo? Again, I would probably get some different answers depending on who you ask. Which one of these objects is going to last the longest? Um, you know what? I'm, I'm, I still might get some different answers. I, my vote is the rock, yeah. Um, but you know what? None of them is going to last forever. I mean, it's, it's easy for us, isn't it, to get our minds fixed on things down here on earth. But God wants us to focus on him and on the things that last forever. You know, part of growing up involves understanding the proper importance of what we see. Because 
a, a little toddler like my granddaughter, Bella. She might see a, a brightly colored balloon like that just a little distance away, but doesn't yet understand the importance of looking both ways before crossing the street to get to it. What are God's priorities? What are some of the things above that Paul was talking about? Is he talking about the physical things above, the sky, the stars? No, but rather God's kingdom, his glory, his love for people, our Christ-likeness, our character. James says in his book, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And Jesus said, right before he left the disciples, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Those are some of God's priorities, things above. And we talked about this last week a little bit when we were exploring prayer. As we connect with God in prayer, we need to be asking him to reveal to us what is on his mind and heart, what his priorities are. And then we need to do our best to come alongside with him in those things as he is working those plans out in this world. You see, God wants us to experience new life in Christ by setting our minds on God's priorities and secondly, putting to death the old life. Back to Colossians verse 3 says, For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Wait a minute, what, Paul? How did we die? We're still here. I mean, but if we're followers of Christ, then we have died to the old way, our old self, our old habits and ways of thinking. He goes on in verse 4, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So if you're a follower of Jesus, there is more to your life than what you experience with your senses here on earth. All right, everybody do me a favor for just a moment, okay? I want you to close your eyes for a second, just for a few moments. When you close your eyes, the realities of the visible world around you are hidden, aren't they, while your eyes are closed. They're still there, but they're, they're hidden. They're still very real. And in the same way, there's an element of our life in Jesus, what we speak of when we say the spiritual, that is hidden from us and the rest of the world now, but will be revealed to us when he returns. And I'm sure in an even more dramatic fashion than we experience when we open our eyes. Okay, you can open your eyes. Bam, everything comes back, right? Guess what? It was, it was here while you had your eyes closed. In the same way, there is a part of our lives that we are not experiencing now that's hidden from us. But when Jesus comes and his glory is revealed, it's going to be like we're going to be opening our eyes in a fresh new way, folks. Verse 5, he goes on to say, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Wait, again, Paul's saying, he just said, verse 3, you died. So what's he saying now here that we're, we got we to gotta put something to death again? Put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Why? Well, this is serious, folks. This is life and death serious spiritually. Because you see, Paul understood that even though the believers in Colossae had died to themselves at some point, it's not really a once and done kind of deal. It's a daily decision on the part of Christ's followers. And Paul goes on to list the things that so often help our earthly nature, our old self, rear its ugly head again. He lists them right here. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, he says, the wrath of God is coming. Did I mention this is serious? Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Now, I don't know about you, but generally when I hear the phrase wrath of God, I think Old Testament God. Wrath of God, you know, big, big, strong God's coming after the bad guys, right? But guess what? That phrase, the wrath of God, is, it's used five times in the New Testament. And you guys, as I was going through and doing a, doing a, a word search for that, 
I couldn't find that phrase one time in the Old Testament unless I went to the King James, and then I just found it the one time. So it's used five times more in the New Testament than in the Old Testament. So it's a real thing that we have to be aware of. Paul says, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. You used to live like this, doing these things before you came to Christ. He says, but you've put to death the old self. Now continue to do so. Continue to put those things down. Verse 8, he goes on, he says, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips, do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the name, in the image of its creator. So Paul's saying, you guys, you need to take your faith to the next level and get rid of those things too. Anger, rage, malice, all of those things. And between these two lists, I count 11 things that people often struggle with from their old life. And my guess is that most of us aren't struggling with all 11. Okay, but if we're honest, we probably struggle with at least one or two of these as we are walking with Christ even right now. But those things aren't fitting for those who are putting on the new self, which is in the image of our Creator. Let me put it to you this way. These outfits that you're wearing today, we're dressed up for Sunday church. Is that the outfit you'd wear if you were going swimming? If you're going to hop, ready to hop in the pool? Probably not, right? It's probably also not the same outfit that most of us would wear going to bed, okay? And in the same way, when we start following Jesus, we're doing something different than the way we used to live. So Jesus helps us to take off the old things, the old way of life, and to start putting on the new, getting dressed for living in his kingdom. And here, you guys, at the beginning of this new year, it's a perfect time to be changing out of those old ways and stepping into the new things of God, the wardrobe for God's kingdom. So Paul's going to share with us some of those things, but I got to tell you, it's not quite like putting on a new shirt or a jacket. Verse 11, he goes on, he says, Here in Christ, there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. I don't know about you, but I don't use the word Scythian every day, so I had to look it up. <laughs> uh, apparently, though, the, the Scythians were a group of nomadic people in the Middle East known for their beautifully ornate metalwork and brilliant artwork. If you Google Scythian online, you'll see some really fancy pieces of gold artwork. Um, so Paul's making comparisons here. He holds up barbarians on one hand and Scythians on the other. Okay, two opposite ends of the spectrum, along with Gentile and Jews, circumcised or uncircumcised. He's basically saying, guys, in God's eyes, everyone is equal. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We are all standing in the same place in need of a Savior. We are all prisoners in need of a deliverer, helpless and lost in need of a rescuer. And Jesus Christ is the one for everyone, everywhere around the world. It's the same Savior for everybody, regardless of whether you happen to be a Scythian or not. And it's only through him that we can live victoriously and put to death our sinful nature. Verse 12, Paul continues. He says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, and I'm going to put the pause right there, because I want you to hear this. Before we get to the part about clothing ourselves with kingdom apparel, did you just hear how Paul describes the followers of Christ? God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Chosen, holy, that means set apart for a special purpose and dearly loved. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope that you are hearing this today. Because you guys, we have an enemy. And if he hasn't already, one day he's going to be at your side as, as that little voice or that little thought in your head that says, nobody cares. No, as in, nobody cares about you or what you're going through. 
don't listen to him or that lie. Okay, because if you are a follower of Jesus, you are chosen. You are holy. You are dearly loved. And don't ever, ever let anybody make you forget that. God wants the new life for you, the best life for you. He wants us to experience that new life in Christ by setting our minds on his priorities, by putting to death the old life, and by putting on the new life. All right, so get ready. Here comes the part about putting on our new self. Verse 12, I already said, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Let's take those one at a time for a moment. Compassion is a sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. Kindness, being friendly, generous, and considerate. Humility is a a modest view of one's own importance because God is God and we are not, right? Gentleness, being kind and tender or mild-mannered. And patience, accepting delay or trouble or suffering without getting angry or upset. Each of these things, my friends, can only be expressed in our relationship with others. Did you catch that? God loves you, and he wants you in turn as new creation in Christ to show compassion and kindness and gentleness and humility and patience toward others. Because every single person on the face of this planet has been made in the image of God. They are worthy of our respect, our kindness, our gentleness, our consideration. And when we reflect the love of our Father in these ways, it helps them see our Father's qualities up close and personal, those qualities of compassion and kindness and gentleness and patience. Paul goes on to say, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. That phrase, bear with each other, that's an active concern for others, not passive, right? That means you're picking something up. You're helping somebody else along. And forgive. Folks, there's no room for grudges in God's kingdom family. Forgiveness is a huge part of putting on the new self. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. He forgives freely and generously, doesn't he? We all are are counting on that. And he wants us to do the same for others. But it's not easy. But it's important. Think for just a moment about Jesus' words while he was hanging on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Folks, he'd done nothing wrong. He didn't deserve to be there. He had every right to ask God for justice or to stop what was happening to him. But instead, he asked God to forgive those who were wronging him. And if Jesus can do that, and our Father can forgive us, then we must learn how to forgive one another. Maybe you've heard This passage, Lord, Peter said, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Man, he thought he was was going big. And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times. Some translations will say 77 times. Other translations will say 70 times seven, as in like 490. Basically, over and over and over again until you lose count. Forgive one another as the Lord forgave you. Verse 14, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love. We love, we love throwing that word around, don't we? we? We do it so lightly and so flippantly in our culture. But did you know that love is not the same thing as, say, tolerance? Tolerating someone is not the same thing as loving them. Trust me, I've done a lot of tolerating in my life, and not near enough loving, I'm afraid. See, love is active. 
Tolerance is passive. Love often goes out of its way to help someone. Tolerance goes out of its way to avoid helping someone. As you are putting on your new self, dressing in the garments of God's kingdom, over all those other things, Paul says, put on love because it ties them all together. Verse 15, he says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. This peace of Christ, it's not like peace that someone might think about. Like, it's not like a, a, a I don't picture it like a, a baby being asleep at peace. That's one kind of peace, okay? But this is more, again, of, a, of an active, whole, family-wide peace. Like a big family pitching in together to rake the yard after, you know, all of the oak trees drop their leaves, you know? Or coming together on some other big project or mission. That kind of peace, that's what I imagine as the peace of Christ. He says, and be thankful. Guys, it is God who's opened the way for us to live this new life and to clothe ourselves with these qualities of his kingdom. So it's only right and fitting that we express our gratitude to him often. Paul continues in verse 16. He says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. I am so glad that Paul included this line, this exhortation to, to teach and admonish one another, and, but not just with words. He says, with psalms and hymns and songs, you know, singing to God. I'm so glad that we had you guys, and Joshua, David group with us here this morning. That was so awesome. Again, you guys were doing just that, teaching and admonishing us through those spiritual songs, and we thank you for that. And that's what we need to be doing for each other, working to encourage and challenge each other from God's word, and sometimes, yes, by singing to each other. So we may need to, to reconsider how we are, have all these chairs arranged. You know, sometimes we might just need to put them in a big circle or something and sing right to each other instead of all to the front. Verse 17 We'll wrap up with this. Whatever you do, Paul says, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. All right, guys, that is a great wrap-up line for us today. Read it again. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So would that comment or action you are about to say or do be pleasing to Jesus? Would that thought or that deed be worthy of his stamp of approval? If not, you might want to reconsider putting it out there. Or you might need to think about asking for forgiveness if you've already done it, both from God and from the person that you said it or did it to. God wants you to experience the, his new life in Christ, the new life in Christ is made possible for us through the new covenant, which God made available to everyone through the work of Jesus with his death and his resurrection. And you know what? Just before Jesus paid that ultimate price, he spent some time with his disciples around the table at the Last Supper, and he presented to them the bread and the cup that would represent his body and his blood of that new covenant. And at that time, he instructed his followers to remember him, to carry on this practice, to remember his sacrifice through the, the cup, through the bread. And we call, of course, that special remembrance communion. And we're going to close out our time this, this, this morning with a time of communion. And for those of you who may be new to Countryside, I just want to say that we don't require you to be a member of our church to share with us in communion. We only ask that everyone who shares in communion does so from a heart prepared to do so in humility and with gratitude for what Jesus has done for us. And if for some reason there's, there's someone here uh, who doesn't feel ready to share in this this morning, we just want to say it's okay. Feel free to just take a pass this morning. I think God will understand. So I want to invite you to get that, get that cup ready. And you'll notice that these things are kind of weird. There's, there's a, a little wafer on one end and, a, and some juice on the other side. We want to make sure that we start with the wafer end up 
All right, so we'll get there in just a moment. So you don't have to open or do anything right with it right now, but just make sure that it's ready. Listen now as, as I read to you the invitation for God's people. You who truly and earnestly repent of your sins, who live in love and peace with your neighbors, and who intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort. And humbly kneeling, make your honest confession to Almighty God. Would you please bow your heads with me as we pray? Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we confess that we have sinned and we are deeply grieved as we remember the wickedness of our past lives. We have sinned against you, your holiness and your love, and we deserve only your indignation and anger. We sincerely repent and we are genuinely sorry for all wrongdoing and every failure to do the things we should. Our hearts are grieved and we acknowledge that we are hopeless without your grace. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us, cleanse us, give us strength to serve and please you in newness of life and to honor and praise your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's continue our confession as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. The words are printed before you on the screen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you would please take a moment and peel back the top layer and take out that little wafer and just hold it up for a moment before the Lord. In the night of his betrayal, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And now if you would do the same thing carefully, peel back the layer of revealing the juice, and you don't have to pull it all the way off. You can just go like halfway and hold it up before the Lord for a moment. In like manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your Son. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice on our behalf, which has opened the way for us to live a new life in you. We're so thankful, and we want to just express our gratitude in the days ahead. And God, as we, as we walk through this new year, God, I pray that each of us will be daily working to to put on the, those new clothes of the kingdom. Those things that we've talked about, those qualities that are, that are the kingdom apparel so that we are ready. We are ready for life in your kingdom. And God, you want us, again, to be doing that here and now. And you want us, God, to be showing others what that's like so they too can come into your family in this new and special way. God, we love you so much, and we want to pray these things in your precious name today.